All right, so here's my disclosures, which will matter more for my second talk than, than this one. Um, so again, Sam touched on this, and I think we all know that there are obviously differences in patients with bladder cancer, right, for non-muscle invasive disease. And I think I spend so much time with our house staff talking about, okay, how do we put the people in the right boxes so they get the right amount of therapy? Not too much, not too little. Really, it all kind of comes down to the European trials, thousands of patients, where clearly if you look at recurrence by risk, it differs. And so how do we take that data and then translate it into individual patients? So this is my editorial of Sam's risk stratification. And so, again, I tend to talk, think about these as turtles, rabbits, wolves, and bears. Again, I, I have young kids, but also work a lot with residents. Um, so, you know, the turtles, obviously, those are our low-risk patients, and Sam covered those. We do, those are your low-grade tumors that are smaller and the pun lumps. You know, again, really, most of those are going to be pretty good, no matter what you do, and we probably over-treat them. Uh, the, the rabbits, as Sam mentioned, those are the intermediate risk, and there's a lot of controversy in that group. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about those. You know, I think the real wolves, the ones that, you know, patients show up and say, I just have a stage one bladder cancer, um, those are pretty aggressive. And realistically, we should probably focus more on those. But then the bears, the ones that are the apex predators, those are the T1s with you know, LVI, variant histology, those are ones that we really should, should treat very differently, right? So, so this is what drives all that, you know. Again, for the low-risk patients, our end game is recurrence, you know. And so many of these patients, as you know, show up and they're worried about dying from bladder cancer. And I think it takes a little bit of time to back away from that concept and get to, you know, our end point here is decreasing the burden of your care rather than dying from bladder cancer. So again, it's a bit of risk and goal adjustment. Again, intermediate risk, most of that's gonna be recurrence. But I think when we get to high risk, again, those are the wolves and sheep clothing. Those are the high risk patients that some of them are gonna die from bladder cancer and trying to find those is hard. I think we know very little about the very high risk patients and how many of them are gonna ultimately not do well and we probably should focus more on that. So again, the low risk, bladder cancer, and I've tried to editorialize this a little bit because Sam covered the guideline approach. Um, so again, risk of recurrence is very high. Again, most of those are gonna be just local TA low grades, um, but the progression's very low. So they're not gonna die from bladder cancer. So there's a lot of time I spend at least talking to patients about that. Um, really trying to reduce the burden of that. Um, I do really think that the biggest thing, and we're gonna talk about that, is giving intravesical therapy right at the time of TUR. But we should probably do less frequent cystoscopy, and no one really knows how to do that. Um, I think, you know, Peter just really talked about all the different markers you can use. I try to implement those as soon as I can for these patients. Um, you know, our guidelines say you should watch them, what, five years? I, but I'll tell you, after three, I start talking to folks about that. I think that these are hard patients to potentially break from your practice because they're so worried about recurrence. But you say, well, what if I send a kit home to you, and if that's positive, that means you need a test, and we can bring you in for a cystoscopy then. And if it's negative, again, the high negative predictive value is very, very good. So um, that's really where I've tried to use molecular tests in my own practice is to again, open up cystoscopy spots for patients that really need them and have these patients reassured that really they're, they're doing okay. Again, don't use BCG. I, I think, uh, again, that's a common thing that people do that I think is not incredibly helpful. But I try to use office-based fulguration for these patients as much as possible. Uh, I will say that the new flexible scopes that have suction on them are really helpful for that because you can fulgurate patients even on Plavix. Uh, and then just fulgurate them in the office. So there's some new technology that makes this, you, you, blue light's great, but the, fulgur, the suction and fulguration, to be able to do that in the office really is very good. Uh, and then again, you don't need cytologies for these folks. It's just kind of a waste of resources. So, um, you know, this is SWOG 0337. Again, probably the best thing we can do for these patients is give them intravesical therapy at the time of their TURBT. So this is Ed Bessing study, big study, showed an overall 33% improvement in recurrence by giving a single dose of chemotherapy. Now, the key to this is that you can actually do this in the office as well. So if you fulgurate a tumor in the office, 
many of us at least can get chemotherapy that day and say, well, just hang around. If you could hang around for an hour, we can give you a single dose, and, and that may have an effect. So I really try to use this in our practice for these patients. Again, it's frustrating to have a recurrence, and if they're not on therapy, giving them a dose of gemcitabine or mitomycin can, can decrease the risk. And again, really well tolerated. Um, so intermediate risk is a bit of a different group of patients. Um, I tend to think of them as folks who've had the low grade and recur, or small high grades. And again, it's a little bit controversial in our system that we've lumped these two phenotypes together. Um, and I think that's where, you know, I know you mentioned that you don't love the new intermediate risk stratification that Ashif Ashish is suggesting, but, but that's a really heterogeneous group. Um, we give most of them chemotherapy or intravesical therapy. I usually start with chemo because, you know, no one's got BCG. Uh, so I hate to give this group of patients BCG if I can, and I feel like, again, the risk of progression is so low that why not start with chemo, and if they recur, at least they've shown that they need something more. So again, I usually do chemo. I give uh, six doses and then I give monthly because I feel like the mechanism is different than BCG, right? So BCG, we give three, six, 12. Um, this is different. It's monthly dosing because the drug works differently. And then again, we probably do too much cystoscopy in this group, but you know, they usually get a scope every three months for two years and then cytology is helpful. So again, uh, this is a really heterogeneous group. So you know, there's low grades that show up and have recurrence and even though you say, well, you're intermediate now, you should get intravesical therapy, many of them say, I don't want that. Um, and I don't think that's unreasonable. I think that's really the discussion and the art of what we do. Um, but it's an unmet need, right? Because we probably don't know what to give them. You, if you give them BCG, the tumors don't respond. You give them chemo, they don't always respond. Um, and so I, I occasionally see people who patients, some urologists has talked about cystectomy for recurrent low grade. I think obviously that's over, overdoing it, but it just shows the frustration in not knowing how to help the patient. Um, and so my, my tolerability ladder is usually gemcitabine, mitomycin, and docetaxel if they don't respond or don't tolerate it. I think most people do well with gemcitabine, but there's a lot of nausea that patients have. Just maybe 10%, they just don't do well, and they actually do okay with mito. So I, that's sort of my second, my second one. Um, now, Sam showed this slide. I think this is a nice framework to thinking that the whole group behaves a little differently and they don't all need the same thing. Uh, I have a lot of folks that fit in, again, to the low-grade recurrent group that still don't want to do intravesical therapy, but they're okay with cystoscopy. So that's kind of like they want more surveillance, but they don't really want to do anything, and uh, I think that's pretty fair. So I, I think this is getting towards dissecting that intermediate group, group a little better. Um, now, high risk is totally different, right? So high risk, those are the patients that we worry about a lot. And so for those patients, you know, CIS, T1s, large TAs, you know, progression is still a big deal. Really, BCG is, a, you know, probably the mainstay of therapy for those folks. I miss giving three years of therapy. I think that was really effective. But again, we don't have that. So it's a lot of time in the office explaining to people why they can't get BCG. Um, at least at least in our group. So uh, again, cystoscopy is going to be every three months. And then imaging, we don't really cover very well in our group, but I think that's actually really important. I've had a few folks who've been NED in the bladder that show up with metastatic disease that you just miss. If, so if you don't image anybody, you're going to miss that. And so I tend to try and rec put set remind. There's a, a reminder in EPIC, which is our medical record, that I say every year, try and remind myself to order imaging because I I just forget about that, but I, I think it's an important piece of their, their follow-up. Um, again, CIS is a really special case, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's uh, patients that start with disease. They start, they're one of the few people, unlike papillary disease, who start with cancer when they go into therapy. So you're trying to get rid of that. Um, so I give them usually three months, and then at six months, I map all those patients in the operating room. So they get a blue light, they get quadrants and biopsies. So I, I really think that that kind of augments, did they respond or did they not? And then obviously if they don't, uh, then, then they need to, to go on to something else. All right, so this is a great paper uh, from Ashish Kamat sort of updating like what to expect in the current line. Because I think some of our old nomograms are probably a little rough as far as saying response rates to BCG. 
So I think this updates it. It's a really nice paper. Um, and I think the things that you can kind of get from this, again, are that CIS is an independently worse outcome for patients. So if they have CIS, we should be treating them differently. Um, this is, Sam touched on the European system here that sort of went to a very high risk. I don't think anyone in the U.S. is really doing that. I think, you know, there's a calculator, which I can never find when I Google it. Um, but I do think it, it's, again, telling us that not all high risk is the same, and maybe we should be have another risk category to consider maybe in the next iteration of the AUA guideline. Um, I, think, I think we're going to talk a lot more about IV therapy and, and what to do with it. You know, I'm in my, the talk I'm going to give a little, a little bit about new trials, there's three randomized trials of 1,000 patients coming out. Um, and all of them have systemic therapy. So the question will be, who should get that? When is the risk benefit there for patients? It's got to come into our risk stratification because clearly, you know, a three centimeter TA tumor may not benefit from it, but maybe someone else should. So it'd be great if there are biomarkers that could help guide us. But right now, clinical staging, I think, is going to be really important to figure out at what point does that tip over for the patient where they're willing to, to do systemic therapy. All right, so uh, I kept that short. I think, again, Sam covered a ton of it. But again, for low risk, I think we should try to minimize intervention. For intermediate risk, there's some heterogeneity and you know, intravesical therapy and surveillance is probably important. But at high risk, it's all about progression. Thanks.